Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Carol Weil at the National Cancer Institute, and on behalf of our entire Enrich Forum team, welcome to today's presentation featuring Nikki Martin, Director of Precision Medicine Initiatives at the Lung Cancer Advocacy Organization, Longevity, and Sue Friedman, Executive Director and Founder of the Advocacy Organization, FORCE, or Facing Hereditary Cancer, Empowered. As many of you know from attending our prior events, Enrich is NCI's speaker series focusing on ethical and regulatory issues in cancer research. A few logistical points before we get started. All lines have been muted upon entry and will stay muted for the duration of the webinar. If you experience any technical difficulties, please use the chat feature on the right-hand side of your screen and contact the host of the webinar who will assist you. You can submit questions at any time by using the Q&A feature. Please type in your question and select host before hitting submit. We'll moderate these questions for Sue and Nikki after our speakers finish their presentations. While we may not get to all questions in time, we'll do our best to address them now or after the talk. If you require closed captioning, please refer to the media viewer panel you will be asked to enter your name. And now I'll introduce our speakers and turn the floor over to them. Nikki Martin is Director of Precision Medicine Initiatives at Longevity Foundation, where she focuses on accelerating access to precision medicine and particularly biomarker testing for lung cancer patients. Nikki came to patient advocacy after holding multiple roles at pharmaceutical and diagnostics companies, including Genentech, Novartis, and Griffold, where she collaborated with patient advocacy groups across different cancer types and other disease spaces in the U.S. and around the world. Her industry experience has given Nikki a vantage point to understand the role that patient advocacy organizations can play in convening a variety of stakeholders to address the unmet needs of patients and develop long-term high-impact solutions. Sue Friedman was a practicing veterinarian when she was diagnosed at age 33 with breast cancer. Sue later learned that she carried a BRCA2 mutation and faced challenging medical decisions related to her hereditary risk. In 1999, after finishing treatment, Sue left her veterinary work after founding the national nonprofit organization Facing Our Risk of Cancer Empowered, or FORCE, to assure that no one else would have to face hereditary cancer alone. For over 20 years, Sue has been the executive director of FORCE, leading the organization's education and research efforts. Before turning things over to Nikki and Sue, I want to note that the views expressed in their presentations are theirs and not necessarily those of the NCI, the NIH, or the HHS. And now I'll turn things over to our speakers. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, we're really excited and honored to be here today to present on a topic that is, you know, really a passion for us. Um, we're going to be describing some of the work that we have done um, collectively as part of a larger, uh, larger consortium of groups um, in developing consistent terminology for um, certain um, terms in um, precision medicine. So we'll, we'll be just presenting some of the process and some of the reason why we decided to do this work and then some of the results. So just a little bit about FORCE. Um, we are a national nonprofit organization. We're um, dedicated to improving the lives of people and families affected by hereditary cancer. So many of the patients and people that we outreach to and provide education and um, resources, research and um, peer support to are people who have been affected by an inherited mutation or a germline mutation that increases their risk for cancer. One of the things that we see a lot of both throughout the community is confusion between, you know, uh, gene mutations that people are um, born with and, um, and some of the other biomarker um, that are used to really um, dictate treatment for cancer after cancer has developed. Hi, 
Hi, hi everyone. Sorry, I was I was muted. So my name is Nikki Martin. I am the director of Precision Medicine Initiatives at Longevity Foundation. And uh, Longevity, as Carol mentioned, we're a nonprofit patient advocacy group in the lung cancer space, and uh, we focus on three main areas: uh, re accelerating research to, for patients, uh, empowering patients to be more active participants in their care, and uh, third, removing barriers that patients face in accessing the right treatments. And part of that is, of course, uh, removing barriers that they face to testing, and specifically for lung cancer patients, biomarker testing. Um, that's, that's critical, and a, a lot of our effort is uh, focusing on precision medicine and making that available to all types of lung cancer patients, um, regardless of uh, ethnicity or location where, where they might be treated. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here today, and she's going to take take you through um, some of the key fa fundamentals of communication with patients that have kind of like been um, the baseline from which we started this collaborative effort. Thanks, Nikki. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about health literacy and plain language and really some of the work that FORCE has done and, and some of the reasons why we were really excited to join this group effort. So, you know, recently the CDC um, issued a new, um, a new definition for health literacy and we really like it at FORCE and um, a lot of our collaborators, because they, they include in health literacy, the personal health literacy, what we think of usually when we talk about health literacy, and that is from the perspective of the person or the patient receiving the information. Um, and we know that it's important that, um, you know, a lot of this, there's a lot of different factors that determine the health literacy of an individual. but. The fact, of, the fact that it has now been expanded to include in the definition organizational health literacy really takes the onus off of the individual and makes this really more of a, um, a global issue that we need to work on together to make sure that we can equitably um, supply people with the information that they need to understand their health, um, their health care choices and make informed decisions for themselves. So, this idea of a personal health literacy as well as organizational health literacy really requires groups like FORCE to think about how we are presenting information that may be complicated or confusing to the patients and not just putting all of the, um, all of the responsibility on the patient. And, you know, one of the things that really has come to the forefront recently is the idea of digital health literacy, and it, it is a lot like um, general health literacy, but it also includes the um, ability for patients to assess the information that they're um, gathering online. And we all know that there's a lot of, um, you know, complications and challenges associated with um, understanding information that is being presented to um, people, and especially in the online space, which is often un unmoderated and there's a lot of access. So at FORCE, we have done some needs assessment over the years to look at things like jargon as a barrier to understanding information and as a piece of health literacy. And in 2016, we did a survey looking at the barriers and facilitators of people in our community accessing and participating in clinical trials. And one of the things that we learned from that was that for many patients, the ability to understand what a study is about strongly influenced or influenced their decision to participate in the study. So, you know, clearly if we can communicate in plain language that patients can understand, it will affect their interest in and um, potentially ability to um, enroll in clinical trials. And this was part of that same needs assessment we did. Um, a little focus group, and this was just one of the findings that we had, just um, presenting some of the um, inclusion and exclusion criteria for a clinical trial um, from clinicaltrials.gov. And, you know, one of the comments of the participants was that I'd need a medical degree to understand whether or not I'm 
eligible for a trial. So that's just one example. Um, and, you know, obviously a lot of this information wasn't written um, for patients to understand. Um, and there's a lot of jargon in it, but it is a barrier to patients understanding if they qualify for a study and potentially enrolling. And then this year, um, earlier this year, FORCE engaged in some other needs assessment surveys to look at referral practices um, amongst several different types of healthcare professionals um, and what some of the barriers are. And so one of the questions that we did ask was, um, what are some of the top barriers to referral to clinical trials? And one of the things that we heard from healthcare professionals was that jargon, the use of jargon in the communications can be a referral, one of the top three barriers to referral to clinical trials and in similar questioning as a barrier to um, referral to genetic counseling and genetic services. So it, for us as an organization, and just a reminder to you know, people in the audience, and again, why we decided that this was such an important initiative to join, um, the importance of communicating in plain language that um, people can understand information the first time they hear it. And this is just a little example of, you know, a uh, doctor communicating with a patient that their pathology report indicates their tumor was benign as opposed to just saying you don't have cancer, which is obviously a lot more plain language and oftentimes, you know, then make sure that the patient is understanding what we're talking about. And we see that a lot. I mean, it's not just communicating pathology results, but as I showed you before, communicating things like inclusion criteria and things like in consent forms um, for patients to participate in research. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nikki to talk a little bit about precision medicine and some of the components and then um, introduce the work of the consistent testing terminology work. Thanks, Sue. Uh, okay, so I'm, I, I know that a lot of you on the line are very knowledgeable and have expertise in precision medicine. So I, but I do wanna just go through some of the key concepts that we were evaluating as a working group, um, so you can see the you know the thinking that we put into this. Um, so first of all, when it comes to precision medicine, the goals as as we understand them and as we're thinking about them for our, our patient communities is to, to 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 run the right test at the right time, to so that the patient can get the right treatment um, at, at the right dose and also at the at the right time. Um, and we're really trying to identify what's driving the cancer, the genomic alterations, and then treat the patient accordingly. Um, how do we make this type of precision medicine a reality for our patients? Uh, through two types of testing. So we're talking about biomarker testing, which is to understand what's happening within the tumor or the cancer. And then genetic testing to understand more about uh, a patient's uh, or, or family member's um, inherited cancer risk. Uh, biomarker testing, the way that we've, we've dis discussed it um, in, our, in our working group, and I'm, I'm sure that, that you would all agree with this, um, is going to be inclus inclusive of testing for um, tissue and blood biospecimens looking for specific types of driver mutations, could be gene alterations and other non-genomic biomarkers like pd one or MSI. Um, this type of testing is um, not limited to just single gene tests. It could be a multiplex um, test, a panel test, um, next generation sequencing, of course. And there's newer types of testing that um, are being developed now and, and um, that we're all aware of and excited about for our patient communities. And all of this is going to give us the benefit of knowing what's driving the cancer. It's going to help the provider and the patient understand their treatment options. And for a lot of cancer patients, it's going to help them understand if they need to be looking at a clinical trial. Um, even first line, first time cancer patients might find that the clinical trial is their best option um, rather than the standard of care. 
So biomarker testing is super critical for um, cancer patients today in this world of precision medicine. Germline genetic testing um, is, of course, uh, we refer to it um, as genetic testing. It can also be referred to as germline testing and also germline genetic testing. Um, so this is really looking at, at, at cheek swabs or peripheral blood for um, changes in, in inherited mutations in the patient's DNA. Um, and the benefits of this type of testing is it's going to clarify the cancer risk uh, for the patient, um, really enables uh, some kind of communication or um, testing for other family members if needed. And it can also uh, de help determine like uh, treatment decisions and also clinical trials. So this type of testing for certain kinds of cancer patients is also critical. Um, but we also know that these tests are extremely underutilized uh, compared to what clinical guidelines would be recommending. Um, these three bullet points uh, summarize some of the most recent data that we have for just a couple of cancer types. Um, colorectal cancer, 40% of patients are not being tested for guideline recommended biomarkers. In lung cancer, a 2019 study in a, in a community cancer practice showed that at the time there are seven approved um, uh, guideline recommended biomarkers that should be tested for, um, but only 7% of eligible non-small cell lung cancer patients were being tested for those. And finally, on the germline genetic testing rate side, across multiple cancers, uh, data shows that, um, it, that this testing rate is below 50% of what guidelines show. So this is really stunning data and a lot of us, well, all of us um, in the oncology world are um, concerned about this. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons why testing rates are low. Um, and when we got together as, as a, patient, a wider patient advocacy community to talk through some of these um, reasons, um, whether it's poor sam sample collection, um, tissue acquisition can often be challenging. Um, the way the tissue or the blood is handled can can also um, not not result in the proper type of testing being done. Um, poor access to genetic specialists, insurance, and preauthorization policies can be a barrier. But the number one thing that we were looking at as as a patient advocacy community was this low awareness of testing. It's on the provider side, and it's also on the patient side, and at a very basic level, um, we we know anecdotally and also through uh, uh, formal studies of our patient community that patients are confused about testing and that we believe that this confusion about testing can lead to um, lack of, uh, you know, awareness and um, I guess empowerment to ask for the right kind of testing and to have conversations about testing and um, the results. Uh, with their providers. So um, here are a few quotes that uh, Hughes Group Force and also another organization living beyond breast cancer have uh, collated from their patient community really underscores for patients that um, are in the breast cancer space and a lot of them face this whole idea of genetic testing or genomic testing, which is uh, very confusing for the layperson. Um, but things like, I don't understand the jargon, um, I don't understand it being testing despite asking my doctor to explain more than once. Um, the third quote is especially telling because, you know, some people talk about the tumor having a BRCA mutation versus the person having a BRCA mutation. I still don't get that. Um, these are difficult concepts uh, for the average person who's newly diagnosed with cancer to understand. Um, the other quote that I find especially telling for the work that we did as a coalition is the last quote, which says, when I had testing in 1997, my result was a deleterious mutation in BRCA2. My relative with the same mutation was told she had a pathogenic variant. And there, there's, there's going to be confusion because of the various terms that were being used um, to describe similar things. 
Um, and we see that not just in the way that the results can be explained, um, but we also see that in the way that the testing can be talked about. So this data is from the lung cancer patient community from this year. And um, we did, lung, this is uh, Longevity did a survey uh, with, um, we actually partnered with ACCC, the Association of Community Cancer Centers on this research. And we were looking at uh, patients in the longevity network, which is the orange line, and then also patients outside of our network in underserved communities. And we wanted to understand their familiarity with testing terms. Um, we saw that, you know, there's a variety of terms that have been in the patient community for many years now. Um, actually, in an audit that we did in 2015, we saw that there were 18 different terms used for testing in lung cancer patient education alone. So that's a lot of information that's different that people have to grapple with to try and understand what kind of testing they need. And it's still really, the world hasn't changed that much. It's 2020, and you can see that no single term for testing really rises to the top in terms of patient familiarity. And, well, I should say, except for the term biomarker testing in the longevity patient community, um, does have a high degree of familiarity, and that's simply because uh, since 2015, that's been the term that we've consistently used in all of our patient education. We never differ um, from using that term. Um, but you'll see that people do understand the word targeted therapy. They are familiar with that. Even, even underserved patient communities have heard that term before, and that's wonderful because that's the place that we want to get to. But if people still don't have a sense of what's the kind of testing they need to get to that place, um, that means that there's going to be a communication gap that, that we need to try and solve, solve for. So that's what we've been doing. We've been trying to figure out a way to tackle low patient awareness and confusion about testing through a multi-stakeholder initiative. We believe as a, as a patient advocacy community, and you'll see from the, the size of the coalition as a wider oncology community, that by having consistent terms, um, we can really help patients through um, aligning communication so that both patients and providers um, know that they are talking about the same kind of test or the, um, the impact of the result from the test when they're having these conversations. It facilitates better shared decision making and it can decrease any misunderstanding and miscommunication, um, misappointments, th things like that. In this example, you can see the patient thinks that they already had um, genetic testing and they'd let their, their relatives know um, because probably a, a past provider conversation might have indicated that to the patient and that was what the patient was left thinking. Yet the provider is saying, well, actually, you didn't have genetic testing. You had oncotype BX, which is a, a type of a tumor test, biomarker test, uh, and therefore I'd like to refer you to a genetic counselor. So by using terms and jargon and a variety of maybe mis misuse of some terms, um, there can be confusion um, with, uh, on the patient side about what's, what's happening with their care. Um, so this is the working group that we have created to try and address this inconsistent use of um, difficult to understand uh, terms for testing. Um, the patient advocacy groups that have joined the coalition represent uh, solid tumors, blood cancers, rare cancers, sort of the bigger cancers like, you know, uh, prostate cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer. Um, and also pan cancer organizations representing multiple types of uh, patient um, categories. Uh, the professional societies that have joined um, have been representing everything from community cancer providers with ACCC to the pathologist community, the genetic counselor community, and also um, the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer has been very interested in this. Um, and on the industry side, we've been really pleased to see not just the um, pharmaceutical biotech companies, but also laboratories and testing companies 
And all of these uh, organizations that are part of our working group are doing some kind of patient education. And they're, for the most part, we're using different terms to talk to patients about testing. And so by having all of these groups participate, lend their voice, and agree to use more consistent terms, um, we believe that we can make a dent in a patient confusion and awareness levels of testing. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the, the approach that we've taken. Um, we agreed at the beginning of this, uh, we've been meeting for a little more than a year now, and as we've been meeting, we've grown in size but our goal has always been to address uh, confusion and lack of understanding among patients by the multiplicity of terms that's used in patient communication um, to speak to them about testing. Uh, our first thing that we worked on early on was uh, a framework analysis. Uh, we had all of the advocacy organizations that you know, are in different disease spaces um, really map out the type of uh, um, tests that are used to, to, um, to connect patients to the promise of precision medicine, um, the type of biomarkers that are being looked for, the biospecimen type, um, and then the, the terms that they use to talk to patients about testing. And we spent a lot of time over multiple meetings reviewing what's, this, what's similar, what's different, and trying to, to narrow down, um, as a result of this, the number of terms that we were using. And I'll just share a couple of the top takeaways. Uh, I think um, some of you on, on, on this uh, call might be interested in some of the key takeaways we had. Um, it, first of all, the majority of disease states uh, are looking, based on guidelines, to test for multiple biomarkers at one time using next generation sequencing. So that was a, one of the key takeaways we had. Also, that more than 50% of the cancers that participated um, were doing some kind of IHC test in addition for protein-based biomarkers. Um, we also saw that there were actually a couple of disease states that do testing for biomarkers that aren't used for treatment decisions. Um, and so for people that aren't in those disease states, that was, a, that was you know, some, some new information that um, and something we have had to grapple with and, and still grapple with, I, I think, as part of this effort. So um, the last uh, key takeaway was that less than half of cancer types represented um, patients that needed to have genetic testing for inherited mutations. The big, the big aha moment for all of us was when we saw the number of terms that were be, being used to speak to patients about testing just um, across nine different types of cancer, 33 different terms were in use. And I, you know, this is a word cloud and the words that are bigger were more prevalent in the list, the list up of terms. Um, so for testing for somatic, required um, biomarkers. The majority of people were using biomarker testing, but also tumor gene testing, tumor testing um, were also um, pretty prevalent. On the germline genetic testing side, the majority of groups were using the term germline testing, um, but genetic testing was real close behind that as well. And then you can see that a lot of these words, um, you know, reference the biomarker, the specific biomarker that's being tested for, or it might reference the modality of testing that's being tested for, um, or even the brand of the test, the Oncotype DX test. Um, so there's a lot of ways that people are speaking to patients about testing, and in many cases, they're saying the same thing, just using different words. So uh, the first thing we did after that was to say, okay, what is the preferred term that we could use, we could all use as a community for testing for tumor characteristics? We're looking for like a high level umbrella term. Um, and we agreed that biomarker testing is the preferred term that we should, that we would all like to be using and getting our organizations to use um, to speak to patients about testing for these somatic or acquired bio, 
mutations and other kinds of biomarkers. And we selected this because it does a lot of things like covers both blood and solid tissue. Um, it's uh, very broad. So for any um, existing testing technology and for any new testing technology that might be in our future, it's going to be able to um, be, a, but be a term that incorporates that. And uh, it's already the most commonly used and adopted term. So this, this is our, our big umbrella term. Um, the idea is each disease state could use this as, a, as an umbrella, but for explaining what specifically is needed for their cancer, for their patients and their cancer community, um, they can go into more detail. So in lung cancer, we, we would go into more detail by saying um, non-small cell lung cancer patients need comprehensive biomarker testing and then explaining in more detail what that is. But the idea is that we would be using as a high-level umbrella this term umbrella uh, biomarker testing. All right, and this is my final slide. Just to let you know that we did have some other side conversations about, but what about, but, you know, but what about, what about tumor profiling? That was a really popular term. But the reason why uh, we, we did not select that is because it doesn't cover blood cancer and it, um, also, the word profiling is very uh, concerning for uh, many of us because of the negative implications um, it has in our society. We, so we, we didn't want to use that particular term. That the term molecular testing, people felt that it was uh, pretty heavy in, in, as a jargon, jargony term. It's a laboratory term, and it also uh, could not uh, be as inclusive as, as we wanted of, of testing modalities. Um, we also didn't add the term comprehensive, although most cancer spaces are moving in the direction of making sure that uh, certain types of cancer uh, cohorts get comprehensive testing through uh, like a multiplex test. And um, we felt that that would be too, um, too much information, not applicable to everyone, and could be added in this drill down that each disease state does. And finally, um, for, patient, for cancer patients where biomarker testing is used to monitor for disease recurrence, the idea is that you can still use biomarker testing as an umbrella, explain what kind of testing needs to be done for re disease recurrence, and then explain that it's tumor biomarker testing or, or biomarker testing for, dis for treatment decisions as a way to differentiate between those two types of biomarker testing. So that was the process we went through for, for making decisions on um, biomarker testing terminology. And I'm going to turn it over to Sue to explain the process for selecting a germline testing term. Thank you so much, Nikki. Um, so, you know, for us as an organization and actually many of the other advocacy groups involved, um, one of the big concerns was how to distinguish between this biomarker testing and genetic testing. And so we felt that strongly that there was a need for an umbrella term for genetic testing or germline genetic testing as well, especially to orient people between, you know, what um, is testing of the tumor and what is testing for um, inherited mutations. And especially with uh, organizations that deal with the breast cancer, prostate, ovarian cancer spaces where more and more both types of tests are being used. And so trying to use a similar framework, we had several meetings to try and come up with one term that all of the groups could agree with. And interestingly enough, although um, we kind of came into it or I went into it thinking we'd probably choose germline genetic testing and then you know, train patients to understand that because it is um, very specific and already utilized um, a lot by the medical and um, research community that um, even with all the conversations, we could not align on one term. And so we made a decision as a group to actually run a patient survey to see if patients had preferences 
um, with regards to the terms used and use that to guide future discussion. So, you know, initially it was about seven of the advocacy groups um, working together on the survey. But as we, and, and the idea was to do a quick survey to um, get some patient opinions across our different groups and different diseases. Um, or a different cancer site. And, and present it back to the, um, the larger way. Look at the preliminary results. We got a huge job in 101. And so, we also wanted to join the survey, so we opened it up to a wider group of patients, and we ended up. So it sounds like your audio is, is – sorry to interrupt you, Sue, but it sounds like your audio might be cutting in and out. If you haven't stopped your video, I would maybe just turn that off. Uh, so we can uh, make sure that your audio is coming through clearly. Are you still there? I'm not sure if people can hear me. There we go. Now we can hear you. Okay. So the issue, we're not, I'm not going to present the intent, was do patients have a preference with regard to the terms that we use to describe these different types of tests? So we set up the question so people could understand why we were asking this and what we were asking about. And we gave people a variety of um, possible responses and asked them to tell us how much they favored or um, opposed different terms. And you can see from this that we got some pretty, and, and we actually broke it down by the different groups and whether or not people had been diagnosed with cancer um, or if they were high risk or a caregiver, um, what types of cancer. And we really did get a very consistent response. There were two that really floated to the top. There was a testing for enhanced cancer risk. Make um, more opposed, and especially, um, and this was really important. Really, was not favored at all by patients. We also, um, as an organization, even though this was a little bit outside of the um, working group's um, goals, initial goals, we wanted to know, because of the changes in terminology used for inherited mutations over the years, initially um, the term that was favored was deleterious mutation. Um, now pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant is often um, being used to um, indicate when someone tests for a harmful mutation. And so we wanted to see how patients felt about that as well. Um, so we asked a similar question and gave um, patients um, and um, people from our community um, a few options. And you can see that inherited gene mutation, um, although somewhat redundant over even over inherited mutation, came out as the um, top response. Uh, people did not like deleterious or germline mutation, and they did not prefer pathogenic variants. And we do a lot of surveys at FORCE. Um, this was somewhat unprecedented. Um, we ended up with over 1,500 write-in comments from the patient community. Some of them were thanking us for actually asking them what they felt about these terms. And um, 
And interestingly, I will say that this survey was conducted pre-COVID, um, but even, the, even though it was um, before COVID, uh, people really zoned in on um, the term germline and said it sounds like an infection. It sounds like something that you catch, not something you inherit. The same thing for pathogen and pathogenic. So they related the term pathogenic to pathogen and, again, said, it, it said that it sounded contagious. And the one thing we heard over and over again from many patients and um, survey respondents was that none of those terms were plain language. People really preferred inherited gene mutation as plain language, um, you know, words, and that they really preferred the plain language terminology. So based on that, the working group um, decided to choose both the terms genetic testing for an inherited mutation and genetic testing for inherited cancer risk as the preferred umbrella terms for testing for inherited mutations. One of the reasons that many of the groups involved chose both, and, and that was a strong preference for us at FORCE, is that, you know, we see two specific groups of people, people who have been diagnosed with cancer and people who have not been diagnosed with cancer. And for people who have um, already been diagnosed with cancer, if you use the term testing for inherited cancer risk, sometimes the response that you will get is, I know my risk for cancer, it was 100% because I was diagnosed. So we felt like having two terms would give us the flexibility where um, if we're talking to a largely um, you know, population of people who had already been diagnosed, that we could say genetic testing for an, an inherited mutation um, versus for the um, population who might be at high risk, indicating that this is about risk. And although it was beyond the scope of the working group, as an organization based on the results of the survey, FORCE decided to use the term inherited gene mutation over the terms deleterious um, mutation or pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant. Um, we felt that if we needed to use qualifiers, we could use harmful and harmless um, versus pathogenic, um, you know, likely pathogenic. So as a group, that kind of is where we are now. We have adopted these terms as a group um, and have agreed to share them, um, you know, use these terms in patient-facing materials, um, and then really kind of spread the word. Um, because we know that this is more than just uh, an issue of using consistent terms when we're talking to patients. Um, the entire, you know, world uses terms and need to communicate with each other. Um, and so if we can use consistent testing terminology whenever we're communicating, um, then it will help make sure that we're all on the same page, that we're all um, speaking the same language um, when we're talking about the same test. So that includes, um, you know, people who are decision makers regarding um, reimbursement, people um, who are developing regulatory oversight, healthcare professionals, patients, um, family members, caregivers, and industry. So we're all really in it together, which is why it is so important that we have such a multi-stakeholder group. And these are some of the work products from um, our working group. We have a website um, that is commoncancertestingterms.org. Um, and on that website, we've developed tools that we want to make as publicly available as possible and share um, so that we can spread the word about this because, you know, consistent terminology is most effective if we're all using it consistently. Um, so we have a healthcare provider education card. We have a white paper that the entire group drafted together. Um, we have the uh, an infographic, the results of our patient survey. Um, and then just a general information, encouraging other groups to join us. And, and we are very open to, we're still meeting as a group. We're open to um, expanding and adding new partners um, and um, really trying as a group to spread the word and then determine what our next steps will be. 
And, you know, these are some of the um, steps that we've identified. One is, as I said, increasing adoption of these terms. And that's, you know, really through presentations like this, through inviting other groups to join on with us and really um, sharing the products of the working group. Um, and then we're trying to work together and communicate with each other, so the groups that are involved in the working group to share best practices um, and what has worked well for us as we um, try to spread awareness. Um, and then um, the other piece is really trying to evaluate um, and measure the impact of this group effort. And, you know, to that end, we really encourage people to reach out. Um, to learn more about the group um, and consider sharing, take a look at our website, sharing the information that we have available and potentially um, participating in the group moving forward. And we did develop, so the working group has developed this survey. We, as we start doing more of these presentations, we'd really love to have, um, um, you know, feedback from people who uh, viewed our presentations, and so this is um, a survey that we've developed, um, and I believe Nikki will put in the chat box for those of you who may want to take this um, little survey about this presentation and tell us what you think. We'd really appreciate it. And with that, I open it up to questions. Nikki and Sue, thank you so much. Those were really great presentations. Uh, I do want to clarify that um, the survey that uh, Sue just alluded to is um, uh, not one that NCI has in any way been involved with, reviewed, or endorses. It's it's from uh, their uh, organization. Um, and uh, just to, to to clarify that before we move on to questions. Uh, and my colleague Charlize Kaganen, who is here, is going to um, uh, shout out the first question. So I'll turn things over to her. Great, yes. Thank you. We have a lot of questions already. So um, the first question is that a lot of respondents have indicated familiarity with the term targeted therapy. So this terminology is used a lot by hospitals and their advertisements to patients, which may be one of the reasons why this is a familiar term. Are you working with any major hospital systems or networks to discuss the adoption of biomarker testing in their communications? Uh, yes, thank, uh, thank you for the question, and um, it's a very good one. Uh, I, so our working group members have been collaborating with hospitals to, to do presentations um, when we've been able to find uh, interested, I guess, uh, shooters who, who are willing to bring us in. I know, Sue, you have been presenting in um, Florida to some Florida-based hospitals, and uh, we've had some interest in having us present at tumor boards um, that hospitals run. Uh, but it's really a matter of finding the right connection, and um, that's why some of the societies that have been participating in this effort um, can play a big role in, in connecting us to their providers and then hopefully those providers to their hospitals. So do, do you want to speak at all about any of the work you've been doing in Florida to present? You know, it, it really has been as opportunities present themselves. We're also trying to work with more of the professional societies because that is a way to reach the healthcare professionals who then may have more influence with the hospital systems. Um, you know, I think the system level is always the ideal target for us, um, but getting in front of the people who are the decision makers um, ends up, uh, I think, being the challenge, but we always welcome um, any ideas, thoughts, and um, groups that may be open to us presenting. Great. Um, so uh, one clarifying question. So you had, I think it was Nikki who had said, like some disease states had biomarker testing that was not used for treatment decisions. Could you clarify what was meant by that? Were you saying that um, they were doing biomarker testing for research or for Oh, no. Uh, oh, no. Okay. So um, what I'm referring to is uh, I think ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, and colorectal cancer have um, uh, biomarker testing that's used to, to see the um, 
progression or um, recurrence of the disease, like a CA125, I think, is the biomarker that was uh, mentioned for ovarian cancer. Does that ring a bell? I, I would expect that um, some, some folks on the line are much more familiar with it than I am, but people raised um, who represented those disease states that they already use biomarker testing as a term to talk to patients about that testing for that specific biomarker, but that biomarker is not used to make treatment decisions. It's, it's used uh, for monitoring uh, the disease, is my understanding. So this complicates, yeah, go ahead, Sue. Part of that was yeah, that if we wanted to use the term biomarker only to um, refer to things like somatic mutations, that then it would exclude biomarkers like CA125 that are used to monitor progression um, to of disease that were not somatic mutations, and just really making the term as broad as possible so that it could include. Um, tests that were already considered biomarkers, but may not have been, like, may have been the, you know, early um, legacy biomarkers that may or may not be considered part of precision medicine. Great. Thank you. That's really helpful to know. Um, so, another question we had was whether your team looked into um, community uh, oncologists and their understanding and whether they were um, communicating with patients accurately about biomarker testing. Do you think um, community oncologists would need this training as well? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think, you know, we do have the Association of Community Cancer Centers has been partnering with us during this, this effort. And uh, there are, there, there is a need to, to um, continue to focus on community-based provider education around this type of testing and the terms that we would like them to use. And ACCC has been help, helping to host webinars. Um, they've featured Sue, who's spoken um, to providers about that. And without a doubt, there needs to be more education. Um, and we would, we're hoping that we'll be able to roll content out in 2021 together with ACCC. Yeah, our our or our working group has not proactively studied that, but that could be something that we try and do in you know in the future. Um, but, but our focus was primarily on, on trying to understand patients and their experience and their confusion. Great. Um, so we have several questions actually about using the term. Variant. So one person mentioned that um, since mutation has a negative connotation, they started using variant. Um, and actually, somebody else, you know, weighed in and thought that they also had a negative commutation. And I guess ACMG guidelines um, spoke to the use of the term variant as well, and had recommended using the term. Or they, ACMG had said mutation has these connotations, and so had recommended the use of variant. Um, how did that go over with your group, and why did you guys choose to go with mutation instead? Yeah, so that's a great question, and we've given it a lot of thought. Um, and it would make sense that mutation has a stigma, um, but it also is the term that has been used for so many years, and so there's consistency. And so one of the things, you know, one of the quotes that we shared was that quote of um, a patient saying, you know, I had a, um, a deleterious mutation and my relative has a pathogenic variant and, you know, like, I don't understand that. Um, I think the other thing that, um, and, and this came up during a, one of the presentations that Nikki mentioned, um, with ACCC, and that is that the term variant up until recently has been used consistently um, as variant of uncertain significance. And we are concerned that for healthcare professionals that are outside of the genetic space, that there is more, and we've heard anecdotally that there is a little bit more confusion when we also apply the term variant to mean, you know, pathogenic variant as well. So I think, you know, there's the two pieces. There's making sure that we are being, um, you know, people first 
um, using people first language that's patient friendly and not stigmatizing, but then also trying to use something plain language that um, people really understand. I was personally surprised to see how many people um, indicated that they preferred the term mutation despite, um, you know, and we didn't give them a lot of choices. So maybe if we just said variant without pathogenic, um, that they might have preferred that. But I do think variant does introduce a lot of opportunity for um, confusion. The other piece of it is that, you know, if we're going to break it down into categories of pathogenic and likely pathogenic um, versus VUS, um, and, um, you know, we can use harmful, um, likely harmful, and still be able to communicate and still have those those nuances as well and, you know, harmless and likely harmless. So I think the intention of providing different categories can be preserved even while we choose language that people really understand. It sounds like a really thoughtful approach to a difficult issue. Um, so another question we had was, whether you had any resources in Spanish or if you were, this is something maybe you were planning in the future? Uh, gosh, we have not talked about developing the working groups resources in Spanish, um, but that that's definitely a good idea. Um, we do have, I mean, a number of our groups, longevity, uh, has um, content available in Spanish, and we're actually trying to take our, our biomarker testing through a health literacy review because it's so important that the, the content be understandable, not just uh, in the language that might be appropriate. Um, and I'm going to guess that Sue and, and others in, the, or in our working group do have biomarker testing or genetic testing materials in Spanish, too. We're in the process of developing more, um, and um, so that is coming for this year, and it is actually, or this coming year, 2021, where we'll have more information in Spanish. I think it raises a really good point, and that is that, you know, we certainly could take the workings of this group and um, translate them if that, you know, if the group decides that's a priority. I think it's an excellent mm -hmm. suggestion. Yeah, I, I'll mention that we we surveyed our the working group members on top priorities for 2021 and beyond, and the the number one priority that people um, voted on um, whether or not we'll go through this, we still have to decide. But is optimizing precision medicine uh, education, patient education, particularly for underserved communities. So everyone recognizes that we need to be doing more of that and um, and sharing it amongst ourselves. So hopefully there will be an opportunity for that. Great. Um, so actually, this is probably a related question then. Um, and I don't know if we missed this, but for could you provide more information about the demographics of who took your survey in terms of education and race ethnicity? And if so, did you have um, any specific preferences or were you able to break it down um, based on these different demographics? Right. Um, you know, unfortunately, that was um, it. It was discussed among the group, and when we initially did the survey, the intention was to get some quick results to present back to the group. Um, and in developing the survey, there were several groups that expressed concern um, about collecting too much demographic information. Um, especially because this was not, you know, done with prior IRB approval. It was done as a, an, you know, anonymous survey that was meant to inform work that we were doing. If we had it to do again or if we ever decided to expand it or repeat this, um, we certainly would start with IRB approval and then, you know, go forward with getting um, – collecting more demographic information because it is something we're asked about a lot, um, but for the purpose of trying to be nimble and include all the groups that really wanted to work with us, we had to make some concessions and that unfortunately was one of them. I will say that um, a couple of the groups that participated are groups that are reaching a very wide demographic of people, although, you know, again, we can't prove that. But, for example, Cancer Care, who had a, almost a third of the respondents, um, they reach a very different um, demographic than 
for example, the group that force does, and they have, you know, shared with us that, um, you know, if they look across broadly across their group, they are reaching a lot more underserved populations than um, many of the other representative groups. Great. So we're, we're actually at the hour now, so I think um, it's time to wrap up. Thank you both of you again. We've had a lot of comments about how you know, wonderful your talk was, and you've done so much great work, and it sounds like you have more planned ahead of you. So thank you for getting us started, and um, have a good afternoon to everybody in the call. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting Thanks everybody. Yeah, thank you so much. Take care, stay safe, and until next time, thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.